Hi, my name's Kelly, um, and I'm aspiring urban green space planner too. And just like you guys, I want to make parks more equitable. One thing I've come across that I can't fully wrap my head around is green gentrification. What can we do to stop that? Thank you. Yeah. We were so close. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, so again, it's the idea of green gentrification. I just want to make sure that I don't characterize your, your question in the wrong way, but it's this idea that really dynamic, bold, beautiful, renovated parks, especially new ones, can actually drive gentrification in neighborhoods. Yeah, and actually be a contributing factor. And I think this is something that is happening nationally. Uh, Maru, Kevin, I don't know if you have anything to, to, to talk to solve that problem. But. tonight's panel. I would like to introduce our panelists very briefly. Uh, please, a nice round of applause for Dr. Madhu Duda Kaler. She's the Associate Professor of Practice and Director of City Planning and Urban Affairs at Boston University. The doctor has over 15 years of experience in the field of urban planning, design, and architecture as an educator, researcher, and practitioner. She's an award-winning architect and planner. She maintains her own international architectural practice, specializing in residential design. The doctor serves on the faculty advisor boards for the Initiative on Cities and the Institute of Sustainable Energy and is a faculty associate at the Party Center for the Longer Term Future at Boston University. Please welcome her with a round of applause, please. I have a good friend here. His name is Kevin Essington and he has served as an environmental professional and leader for over 20 years. Since 2011, he has been the state director of the Trust for Public Land in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, where he's responsible for the effective delivery, delivery excuse me, of the Trust for Public Land's mission to create parks and protect land, creating livable communities for generations to come. Kevin also worked for 10 years for the Nature Conservancy in Rhode Island and Connecticut as Director of Government Relations and as a local conservation program director. A nice warm welcome for Kevin, please. Um, and as you can tell, I'm humbled quite a bit in my position, but I'm especially humbled to uh, introduce the, the next person on our panel. Um, I actually have a tremendous, uh, deep amount of respect for Dr. Ted Landsmark. He is the director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern University and a member of the five-person board of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. He is a president emeritus, uh, <laughs> emeritus of the Boston Architectural College and has been an administrator of the American College of the Building Arts, MIT, UMass Boston, MassArt, and Harvard. He worked for a number of years in Boston city government overseeing urban planning and social justice issues. The city of Boston is grateful to him for his stewardship and leadership. Please give him a warm welcome. So, so we're here to talk about parks and usually my job is to talk about how amazing the park system is and what a great job we're doing, but I do think it's important to start with some of the lost opportunities that we have. Uh, see up on the screen right now is the 1897 map of Columbia Road Plan that was prepared by the Olmsted Corporation. They envisioned a continuing of the Emerald Necklace, a closing of the Emerald Necklace, if you will, that would go from Franklin Park all the way out to what we call Moakley Park today. This would have been transformative. This would have given the, the neighborhoods of Bowdoin, Geneva, Upham's Corner, a gateway to participate in the harbor economy uh, of the city, to really give this this nice sense of green living in the middle of the city, and it was never built. If anyone's familiar with Columbia Road today, it's an incredibly uh, challenging public realm. You know, Columbia Road revitalizationing, imagining a green link from Franklin Park to Moakley Park into South Boston is a key component of the city's master plan, Imagine Boston, the city's transportation plan, Go Boston, the city's action plan, and the city's open space plan. This idea is more than 100 years old, and it's still a really good idea. The problem is it's incredibly difficult to do and we got to get to work on it. But it shows that when we lose out on these opportunities, it's much harder to add in the open space after the fact than when you're intentionally doing it ahead of time. It'd be very uh, big mistake if I didn't talk about parks in the city of Boston and didn't talk about America's first park. Established in 1634, Boston Common, 
And today we have issues around access and equity with Boston Common. Since about 1660, so about 30 years after Boston Common's founding, the Alms House was founded in the city of Boston, so where the city served its homeless population and people who needed assistance. And it was founded at the Park Street right across from Boston Common. So we've had issues around who is using the park, what they're using for the park, people who need to access services in the park ever since then. And I think anyone who's familiar with our current issues at Boston Common, you recognize that this is an incredibly vibrant space, especially because of the stewardship and the partnership the city has with the Friends of the Public Garden, but that we still have challenges, especially with homelessness, especially with the opiate crisis. So we talk about issues around access, equity. America's first park has had those issues since its very inception. It's not easy uh, to talk about parks in the city of Boston or even just the area without recognizing that we live in the shadow of giants. I would like to mention, though, that as I started this presentation thinking about how grateful I am to all the people that I work with, it is important to remember that there was a lot of people working with Charles Elliott and with Olmsted. But it is also impossible to walk through the exhibit, you know, mapping Boston's green spaces and to not see their names on almost every single map and every single design you see. And if it wasn't for these two individuals, we probably wouldn't have Boston's emerald necklace or what we know as the Metropolitan District Commission or now the DCR system that we so enjoy in the city of Boston. As we look at the Emerald Necklace, and of course we have tons of partners in the Emerald Necklace, including Franklin Park Coalition and the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, but we also have to recognize that the real reason it was formed was because of storm water management in a rapidly densifying city. Those are the exact same issues that the city is looking at to solve with open space today. So as we think about adding open space, whether it's in our harbor or in other parts of our city, we're still trying to address some of these issues that the parks commissioners and Olmsted and Elliott were trying to solve back in the 1880s, 1890s, and beyond that. Around issues of equity, though, we also have to recognize that it wasn't always perfect, and it wasn't always necessarily perfectly good. When you look at some of the disciples of Olmsted, you think about people like Shirtliff, amazing, unbelievable landscape architects, but some of the projects that they were associated with, projects that we take enormous pride in, had a very checkered past. We think about places like the Paul Revere Mall, sometimes called the Prado in the North End, and you think about the fact that people's homes stood where that park was and they were moved out so that we can make space for that open space. So there's always trade-offs, there's always conversations to be had. And so some of these spaces don't have perfectly clean history. So while they're addressing social equity needs now, they may have had a challenge in social equity past. As we look at the map of open space in Boston, as was mentioned in the early remarks, we benefit greatly from Elliott, from Olmsted's work, from other people's work, and we do have a 98% 10 minute walk rate. That means that most Bostonians can walk to a park within 10 minutes. Now, what we don't tell you is what if that park stinks, right? So, so as we approach this, we couldn't just say, well, 98% of our residents can walk to a park and that's nice. So back in 2015, Mayor Walsh started the park's first program. And what he wanted us to do is he wanted us to aggressively tackle issues around access and equity, using parks as a tool to address that through excellence and design. And what that meant is we started had to, we had to look at these spaces in a more holistic manner and say, what are some of the problems that we can start to solve with parks? And so one of the first projects that we ran into an opportunity was Children's Park on Intervale Street in Roxbury, and part of it is also in Dorchester. So Intervale Street runs between Blue Hill Ave and Columbia Road. And it is a street, if anyone's familiar, that has been plagued with a history of violence. And so what happened over the years is the park fell into disrepair, but also when it was redesigned, it was cut off from the Leela G. Frederick School in the back, and it was cut off from other entrances. And what happened is they made a very specific entrance so that you could only get in one way, and that also a lot of people didn't feel comfortable using, so the park fell into disrepair. So we took it as an opportunity to say, all right, now if we partner with different city departments, what could this park start to address? As we went into the community meetings, we found out that the residents were really sick of the decrepit, burnt out bodega that was next to the park. 
You know, it wasn't a place that they were interested in introducing retail again to the park. And so what we did is we worked with the Department of Neighborhood Development and said, well, could we have that for land? The Department of Neighborhood Development under the stewardship of Sheila Dillon said, of course you can have that land. And in fact, I'm responsible for some of the remediation on that property. So I'll remediate that land so you can use some of your money for the play equipment and I'll take care of the remediation. This is a partnership that only happened because of the community process. We then found out that there was some uh, children on the street that had mobility issues, so we started looking aggressively at accessible play equipment. We also then found out that the Frederick School, which was located and walled off from the playground in the back, had level four special in inclusion classes. And so these were kids with severe, severe social, behavioral, and also mobility issues. These kids used to get on a bus for 45 minutes on field trips to go play at the Menino Playground in Charlestown because that was the only place that had play equipment that could accommodate their abilities. So these children were going 45 minutes nearly out of the city in order to play when they had a playground in their backyard that they were walled off from. So what we did is we opened up that retaining wall working with the school department, also assessing budgets. And what we were able to do is we we're able to provide a fully accessible tot lot, not only for the school, we're serving the school, we're opening up the park so there's more activity, so that there's less crime in the neighborhood and people feel good about it. We added water play because we do have the heat island effect strong in Roxbury and Dorchester. And then also we added space to the park. The topography gave us the grade for the different, different accessible ramps and things like that. It's an enormous opportunity and it only happens of, and I wouldn't say it's, it's necessarily complaints, but it only happens because of that community input that kicked off this conversation. A city has to be listening, has to be willing to listen to its residents in order to achieve greatness. This is a great park, but it's only great because people told us what they needed and we were able to respond to it. And so that's what we have to do with these spaces. We have to maximize spaces. The last opportunity that I'll leave you with is an enormous opportunity at Saunders Stadium in Moakley Park in South Boston. Now, Moakley Park, this was the space that was supposed to be the completion of the Olmsted Corporation's emerald necklace. And so we think we have an enormous opportunity to renovate this space, to renovate this park so that it serves a couple of different needs. One is, it'll still be the recreational hub for the city of Boston. It's the second most permanent park in our system after Boston Common, but it also has to protect these neighborhoods. And so we're going through a vision plan process right now. I'd be very excited if any of you join that process and join the community input. There's, there's a lot of opportunity to talk about charrettes. It's a 60 acre parcel on the water. It's also surrounded on two sides by the old colony housing project and also the Mary McCormick uh, housing development. These are people who are some of our most vulnerable residents in the city of Boston, and they live at grade or below the flood levels for 2050 and 2070. If we do our job with Moakley Park, not only can we have extraordinary ball fields, but we can also protect them against coastal flooding and storm surge. And so that's what we have to start to do with this system. Yes, we have a 98% of us can walk to a park within 10 minutes, but what can those parks be? That's the opportunity, and that's why we have the speakers here tonight and this expertise in this room. So please, our first speaker is Dr. Madhu, if you could please welcome her to the stage. Um, thank you, Chris, for such a great introduction, both of the panel and the issues that face the city. And I was, good, I was kind of a little worried because my conversation here today might have been sort of at odds with what the city might be saying or then so on and so forth. But I'm really relieved and frankly uh, delighted to uh, welcome you on board and, uh, and really understand that you understand the real issues that plague the city and particularly the green spaces. So just going, looking into this photograph a little deeply, um, of course, all of us know that this is the city of Boston. And if you look a little closer, you'll of course see that there's plenty of high density in this picture. But even within this density, there's a kind of vibrancy it feels like the city's bustling. And then if you take an even closer look, you're going to see the ribbons of green that sort of weave through the city. Yes, we do live in a city that is very, very green by most standards of the world. 
However, this city is also being plagued, like all other cities in the world, with sea level rise, heat waves, um, incessant rain, storms, and so on and so forth. So, of course, like all cities, even a city like Boston, which is so progressive and we are thinking and we are sort of gathering together and collaborating to find solutions, we have to prepare. So, I'll start with a little bit of a teaser and pose this question to the crowd. And let's see, uh, where do you think our primary focus must lie if we are going to prepare for effective climate adaptation of our cities? such that uh, the sea level rise, heat waves, and so on bring. So how many of you think it's A, technology? Show of hands? OK. Welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> how about planning and policy? I'm a planner, so great. I, I would agree. Um, how many would say people? Oh, lovely. We have so many saying people. That's heartwarming. And what about preservation of open green spaces? You know, the right answer is all of them. But I have a favorite one, and that is people. Because really, at the heart of every issue lies what are you going to do for the people? It's not about the parks, it's not about the sea level rise, it's not about the storms, it's about the people who are going to be affected by it. So it's really, really important for us to focus our energies, whether they're in technology, planning, or policy, or preservation of open spaces, that we really put the, put the people at the focus of all our energies. So with this sort of context in mind, I uh, thought of this um, title for today's talk. And uh, the, I, the title was inspired by uh, a very uh, dear book of mine from 1968, uh, Les Droits la Ville. Uh, pardon my French, it's not my first, second, or third language. So, um, <laughs> But really, this uh, book, The Right to the City, uh, spoke to some of the very, how do I say, fundamental things that I felt very deeply about. Because the city was not just about buildings. It was not just about parks. It was not just about playgrounds. It was really about the people and how they could have a right to the city, parks, playgrounds, green spaces, and all. So he came up with a really uh, sort of bigger idea than just sort of having a collective access to urban resources. The idea to the right to the city was that people would have the collective right and could have the collective power to make the transformation so that they could to truly take charge and have a right to every aspect of the city. Somehow my slides are showing funny, but I'm just going to keep moving on. So within this context of climate change, of green being so important, of right to the city being so important, I wanted to underscore before we move forward that climate change and urbanization are arguably one of the strongest impacting factors of the 21st century. And really, the next 100 years are going to be shaped by these two forces. And of course, green spaces and parks are going to play a huge role in them. So within this context, the access to and need for the preservation of urban public spaces becomes paramount. And in fact, just a 10% increase in our green spaces could really keep the temperatures down at present levels into the 2050s, just a 10% increase in green space. So that's pretty powerful, right? Let's go back. Let's go back and look at this image once again, this image of our beloved city. There are so many things that are going on in the city that we are doing to actually make it more 
sustainable, more green, more accessible. In fact, Boston ranks 18th among the world cities for its urban canopy at 18.2%. So it ranks 18th among the world cities in terms of urban tree canopy. And it also ranks 13 out of the 100 US top cities for its park systems and green spaces. So by all intents and purposes, Boston is a fantastic city. We've heard this, um, how do I say, uh, this statistic being rolled around again and again. We're so lucky to be within a 10 minute walk of a green space. Well, I live in Hyde Park. And next time, I'll bring along a picture of the green space that's within 10 minutes and we'll talk. But um, so this, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but this is actually a screen capture of the website Parkscope. And this is the one that the Public Land Trust has been working on, and it's a fantastic website. If you go and you start to sort of compare the data of different uh, cities, you, there's a lot of rich data and knowledge which starts to give you a picture of what's going on. Another really interesting um, uh, site over here is the one called Treepedia, which is uh, work by the MIT Sensible Lab and the World Economic Forum. And again, if you look, Boston seems to have a pretty heavy tree canopy. Yeah. Okay. So if you start to look deeper and if you look at the heat vulnerability index, of the neighborhoods of Boston. So that's a map on the left of, uh, of the neighborhoods of Boston. You'll see that the darker colors, like the orange and the deep reds and so on, are kind of in the center of the city. And that's really where the people are most vulnerable to the heat. Uh, to the heat, and that's really where the poor people of the city live in terms of the data. If we start to look closer, and I'm going to skip over this real quick, the tree canopy also seems to be missing in the same space that, is, uh, that those neighborhoods are where the deep colors are for the heat vulnerability. Um, again, looking at some of the statistics, um, neighborhoods like Roxbury and Dorchester and Mattapan uh, fare really poorly against the whole of Boston. And this, most of all, is one of the most revealing um, sort of pieces of research that we have started to complete, which further brings the point home. So let me see if this video works. Yeah. So what you're going to see is sort of a Google movie of the city of Boston. And what we've started to do is start to map spatially all the different kinds of events, be it awareness, be it technology, be it community events, that are being held by the city in different parts of the city to increase awareness about greens and parks and open spaces and climate change. Now, what is really interesting is that when the whole picture starts to come together, right here, once it zooms out, you'll get a whole sense. What is very, very interesting over here is that right in the center where Matapan and Dorchester and Roxbury are, it seems like the majority of the city outreach is happening more on the outskirts than it is on the inside. So that's pretty powerful because we understand the problem, we are aware of it, we know that um, having green space doesn't mean you have access to green, and more importantly, it seems like the energies are not yet where it should be. So I'll end with the note saying that access to preservation of green spaces is not enough. Uh, the right to the city should ensure equitable distribution of green spaces. After all, we are as strong as our weakest link, and so we should have parks for all. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to be your state director for the Trust for Public Land. Since 1972, 
the trust for public land has created parks and open spaces within a 10 minute walk of over 8 million people across America. Here in Boston, some of the places we've helped create include East Boston Greenway and the South End Community Gardens and parts of the Neponset Greenway. When I came to the Trust for Public Land seven years ago now, exactly because the Trust for Public Land works in cities and because the Trust for Public Land believes that equity matters. So why do we care about equity? It's one thing to say equity matters, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about why I care and why the Trust for Public Land cares. Massachusetts has the fourth worst wealth and income inequality in the country. We also have almost $750 million worth of ignored park facilities across the Commonwealth. As a result, over 600,000 people in Massachusetts live in neighborhoods without access to great parks or open space. Public health research shows that folks in those neighborhoods could have up to 40% worse physical and mental outcomes than those with access to parks and nature. I, we recently did a fair amount of work looking at climate impacts, and we did uh, some, some really uh, informative work analyzing a host of data, but we also at the same time pulled together some stories from some people on the ground. And one that was really telling to me, there was a woman named uh, Nancy in Alston who moved back to Alston to be with her mother who was in her 90s. Her, her neighborhood uh, for her mother's uh, mobility essentially has no park and has very few trees. Her mother has heat-related asthma, which means in the hottest of summer days of which we've had a dozen or more this summer, she can't breathe. And, in, uh, and, and what that means to her in her life is that she cannot leave the house. She cannot get out and connect with her social circle. She cannot get to church, which is one of her big events to go and do every summer. At the Trust for Public Land, we believe everyone deserves a great park. That's why my team's goal is to create a great park or open space across the Commonwealth within a 10 minute walk of 100,000 people over the next five years. So instead, imagine a cool, fragrant, relaxing place for Nancy's mom and her neighbors to meet friends and family on one of those dog days of summer. And then imagine that in every neighborhood, in Boston and in every city in the Commonwealth. So how are we going to do this? We're going to do this by combining good information and data with community-led siting and design. These screen captures are from the ParkServe website that uh, my panelists have very kindly uh, teed up for me already. And you can look up thousands of cities across America and get an at-a-glance look of a very simple metric of how many people are within a 10 minute walk of a park or open space. And Boston is very close to 100 and very close to being the most accessible park system in the country. But the challenge is, as we've heard already, thank you panelists, is that the people who need it are not always able to access great parks. I want to go to an actual project we're working on with with Chris and uh, hopefully with the Boston Public School Department and with the neighborhood in Mattapan at Chittick Playground. And I pulled up both a quick photo of this now somewhat dated playground um, and another screen capture from the park data on ParkServe about this particular website. And I do that for two reasons. One, to kind of, again, help us visualize how some parks can do so much more. And if you were to get out and visit the site, you would see that it, with the tree canopy and there's a, there's a slice of vacant land there and an asphalt 
playground that there's an incredible opportunity to create a great resource, not only for the kids, the teachers, and their parents, but really for the whole neighborhood. And that's the kind of transformative public investment that we're excited to work on with the neighborhood and with Chris. But I want to suggest that the 10 minute walk idea is not only a great way to get a snapshot for your whole city, and it is, but it's also a great way to get a snapshot of who is served by this park. So uh, even though the photo kind of cropped it out a little bit, we can see that in this neighborhood, uh, there are 1,545 children, 1,500 kids that are within a 10 minute walk, 18 and under, kids that can walk to this park. That, that in itself tells me that this is a terrific place to be thinking about an investment in playgrounds. And the bottom uh, slice of the screen capture shows that roughly, if I'm going to say 40% eyeballing it, are households uh, that are considered low income. And if you include low and moderate together, it is almost 2,000 low and moderate income households. Similarly, Another terrific opportunity working also with the Department of Neighborhood Development with Chris, local high school, community center in the neighborhood, and with the good folks from here and now, and Kate Gilbert's with us today, uh, to visualize a climate smart, fun, creative, civic space in what is now a, a, a fenced off, paved over, weedy lot next to a salvage yard. The, the, the city, suggested putting housing on this location. And the neighbors said, we would much prefer some public space for us to get together and function better as a community. And to the city's credit, that's exactly what we're now working to do. And again, 10 minute walk information can be very, very helpful to understand exactly who is it. Uh, in, this, in this example, I uh, screen captured the ethnicity breakdown for this, for this particular park. And you can see th these are folks that deserve this kind of civic space in order to bond together as a community and to function as a group that, gets, that takes care of each other when they need to. Then I would like to cast our eyes a little bit further beyond Boston and suggest that in Massachusetts more broadly, I think our next great frontier for parks and open space is in the gateway cities. And I somewhat randomly picked Brockton as a city, well, not totally randomly because their mayor has actually pledged to ensure that everybody in their city is with a 10 minute walk of a park or open space. And you can see that a city like Brockton is really not unlike cities like Springfield or Worcester or many of the other gateway cities in that only about two thirds of their residents have access to parks and open spaces uh, within a 10 minute walk. It's a big challenge to work in a lot of these cities because the resources aren't nearly as, um, at hand as they are in a city like Boston. And I would also add, it's especially challenging because there are a few dozen of these cities as opposed to one terrific city like Boston to focus on. So look forward to talking to you about the challenge of working in gateway cities next time. Um, but you know, my team can only accomplish these kinds of projects with your help. So I hope you'll join me in the Trust Republic Land team to meet our goal of getting everyone, getting 100,000 people in the Commonwealth within the 10-minute walk of a park. And I do encourage you to go and visit the, the Park Serve kiosk uh, in the exhibit that we we're pleased to have set up with the great folks from the Leventhal Center. Thanks. I'm, I'm a policy guy. Um, and I have the, um, uh, really the extraordinary privilege of being able to study policy uh, from my uh, perch at Northeastern at the Dukakis Center and then to actually implement it um, as I sit in on uh, board meetings at the Boston Planning and Development Agency. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm immersed in data and charts and comparative um, stuff. Uh, but as I thought about uh, this particular uh, talk, uh, it struck me that maybe it would be desirable to go out and actually spend a little bit of time uh, in the parks to get a feel for what's going on at this moment. And so I've spent um, a couple of evenings and uh, parts of a uh, few weekends, just over the past two or three weeks, uh, taking a look at 
what's going on in our parks, particularly as what's going on in the parks relates to issues of equity. Um, and so I want to share a couple of those images with you, which I'm going to run through really fast. I'm certainly not going to comment on all of these, but uh, we need to know what's happening in our parks. Living in the city can sometimes feel very isolating. It can feel very distant, uh, uh, as in this view across Jamaica Pond. Sometimes it feels kind of foggy, as one sees in uh, this image from the uh, art installation that's now going on um, in the Fenway. Um, there's always a, a sense of community uh, that we would like to experience uh, from living in a city uh, because people are always coming and going, uh, in and out. And what we really hope for very often is not so much uh, the ability to be able to be alone, but in fact uh, to be part of a community. Um, and what struck me was that what our parks really are is the common ground that brings people together. Uh, it's the one place, unlike our segregated schools or our isolated neighborhoods or um, our uh, uh, racially uh, isolated workplaces. It's the one place where we come together, so much so that sometimes we create parks where there aren't any. For example, uh, this... Uh, uh, a mural that showed up on the side of a container um, at a tire shop in Roxbury, or this uh, park in the Fenway that is, is kind of a park hiding a construction site <laughs> next to a park. <laughs> and, and sometimes we create our parks in um, really decrepit places. Um, but what our parks really do is to join um, our sense of beauty with our sense of community. I, I found this little park in the Fenway that I hadn't even known existed. There's the park across the street from here. Um, there is Starro Drive when you're not thinking about what it's like to be driving on it. Um, there's the park uh, out in Brighton. And I found this gentleman in Jamaica Plain alone one morning in a park, just kind of chilling. Uh, people go into the parks in the back bay. And sometimes we use our parks as a way of being alone. But much of the time, we use our parks as a way of being with others. The people we care about is um, in this little park uh, outside of uh, Spalding Rehab, uh, Menino Park, and here. Uh, looking out towards uh, uh, East Boston and uh, Charlestown. Um, and here in, in Brighton with uh, a senior and his dog and, and uh, a family member. And even where there are fences, uh, the fences themselves draw us into places that give us a sense of comfort and solace. We uh, use our parks to celebrate um, the great uh, Bostonians of the past, uh, as here on uh, Commonwealth Avenue, or, or here at the monument to the uh, 54th uh, Armory, where uh, just a few weeks ago there was a celebration of uh, the renovation that's going to take place there. We've got great parks. And the fact of the matter is that they're very widely shared by a very diverse group of people. And they're a very diverse group of places. Here at the MFA, for example, looking across the Fenway. Uh, here in the South End, looking at uh, some of the new and old towers that exist. Um, here up in uh, uh, Charlestown, where a, a park has been turned into a little community garden. Um, we have beaches in the city that most of us never get to. And yet, on an average weekend, these beaches are crowded. Uh, we have uh, Jamaica Pond. And we have uh, people of various uh, ethnicities and backgrounds who are taking advantage of these parks on an average uh, weekend or evening. And sometimes our parks can be found in very unanticipated places. For example, here's a park 
in the back of an alley. And here's a vest pocket park outside Children's Hospital, and here's one um, at Northeastern outside an MBTA station, and all of these are places that are well occupied. Here's a park on a median strip on Boylston Street that uh, remains well planted and a great respite as one enters the back bay. Here is what is clearly an urban park. Look at how crowded the steps of the ICA happen to be on the waterfront. And here on the other side of the water is the ICA's latest park space um, in what was essentially a kind of abandoned neighborhood. So what we can see from looking uh, at our parks is that, in fact, they're being used by all kinds of people, young and old, vigorous and not so vigorous. Uh, these folks I found outside of a school in East Boston, they had actually come up from Brockton looking for a skate park. They missed the one they were looking for, but they found another one. And so they uh, were very appreciative and wanted to know when Brockton was going to get this kind of park. We use our parks for kids in Roxbury, in East Boston, in Brighton, Again, at Spalding, for baseball and sports, uh, for selling our favorite country <laughs> uh, 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 food, <laughs> for little kids to play. And this is actually outside of an MBTA station in Maverick Square. And there's the tea stop with a park and a sculpture, a water sculpture. And of course, the avenue on uh, uh, the park on Avenue D, or Lawn on D, where one evening I found just the most extraordinary collection of people who had come together to enjoy each other, to have a beverage, to swing, to be with kids, and to just hang out. So when we think about parks, then we also have to think about the barriers to their use. And what are they, really? Well, one thing we have to think about is our environmental stewardship. The second is how we build a resilient infrastructure into our parks. And the third is how we get to them. What do we do with transportation? What are the multimodal approaches of getting to and using our parks? And also, why is it that we so often involve designers who understand how people really use parks so late in the process? Um, how is park use related to how we manage water? How do we get more people who aren't park advocates to become engaged as advocates? And what are the real metrics that we use to determine quality of life? Just walking outside of this uh, space here, for example, is a marvelous park that has concerts and all kinds of activities. How often of us, how often do we really get into this small space and really enjoy it in the middle of the city? One big issue is that our parks, as much as we would love it if Chris were in charge of everything, are actually under this jurisdiction of multiple agencies multiple agencies within the city, within the state, private entities, cultural institutions, and colleges and universities. So the zoo, uh, while we love being there, has multiple jurisdictions that at one level or another oversee the activities there and its maintenance. And this little park, uh, for example, in the middle of the Prudential Center around the corner from here, it has no, as far as I know, public oversight, but is a wonderful little place to go as a respite and is managed by a real estate firm. So we have to think about the multiple partners who are drawn together as we think about our park uses, real estate entities and universities and colleges, public entities, and multiple nonprofits. And we have to leverage those with and against each other, like this empty site um, that Harvard is going to be developing, so that we can take empty sites which aren't always 
under the city's jurisdiction and turn them into places that in fact, as on the waterfront here and here, and here in Martins Park, uh, which is going up uh, adjacent to the Children's Museum, where we leverage public and private resources uh, to create new spaces and parks. Let me give one example. Northeastern itself in the middle of September is gonna be opening the new Carter Playground. They've committed $108 million to this park over the course of the next 30 years. $26 million in construction, $82 million dedicated uh, to park maintenance. Here's what it looks like today. And that, right in the middle of the city, in a place where it's going to be able to serve not only the university, but also Roxbury and South End and the neighbors there. How do we link our strategies around park development to sustainability, resilience, and open access? And the real question is, what kind of city do we really want to have? Well, for starters, or actually to wind down, we're fortunate in that the Community Preservation Act was recently passed, that a group has been put together to allocate new funds for parks and historic preservation. Um, and to enhance the public trust. And here I point you, if you haven't already taken advantage of this, to um, the three-dimensional maps that anyone can now access that cover the entire city of Boston in real time that show us at uh, elevations and at ground level how we can all be planners and think differently about places like the public garden and how we might use Community Preservation Act funds for preservation on the public garden, or how we can look at parks in Dorchester and ask ourselves how we share resources as between downtown and the neighborhoods, or this park in East Boston where we can ask ourselves, might it not be time for us to build new resilient parks out into the harbor as a way of uh, offsetting the effects of uh, climate change. So I'd close with a couple of quick recommendations. One is we ought to think about lighting up the night more than we do. We ought to think more about parks as they are impacted by handicapped accessibility. We can think more about how our outside spaces can be brought inside, as is the case with the courtyard here. We need to think about how uh, private uh, sector uh, investors can uh, uh, become more engaged in helping us develop our parks. Here's a little nighttime park in JP not far from our, uh, my house. And how many kids love being out at night? And how many adults love being out in our parks at night? And to what extent do we facilitate that? We need to link our parks to resiliency and sustainable infrastructure, to education and health programs, we need to think about the role of landscape architects, uh, health activities going on in the um, uh, new seaport, handicapped accessibility with someone fishing uh, adjacent to Jamaica Pond. And the bottom line is that we need to have more of these kinds of facilitated conversations where we really get into shared policy making uh, and community-based planning. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ted. So, so Madhu, um, the only thing that scares me a little bit is it seems like parks are going to solve every single problem that's facing society now, and that's a little bit daunting. So I guess my question is, when you talk about people being change agents and using parks and increasing accessibility to parks because they are so vital, um, what is sort of the hierarchy of needs that people need to advocate for for these open spaces? And are there wicked problems that are more important than others? Wow, that's a question. <laughs> hmm. Hierarchy of needs. I think, you know, even before we start to sort of structure the hierarchy of needs, I think it is important to know who needs. And, and I think there is a um, gap 
in, in sort of what we want to do and our intentions versus where we are at. And I think that again and again and again, sort of the problem of sort of accessibility, of equity, and, and I'm not talking about just in terms of parks, is sort of taken on piecemeal, sort of as a demonstration, sort of as a pilot, and then there are sort of these big waves that come and go. And I think especially given that we all acknowledge that, you know, uh, because of climate change, because of public health, because of pollution, pretty much, I mean, parks need to be. And, and it's important right now to understand that where is it that the parks are not there? And, and you know, to tell you frankly, you, uh, I, what Ted said, that we really all need to be change agents. And, and you know, very early on, I realized that it's not about uh, bottom-up planning or top-down planning. It really has to all come together. So I think in a way the citizens need to take charge to be able to at least communicate their needs to the city and, and be present. It's like voting, right? Be present when we, you are discussing the future of you know, what your parks and spaces are going to be. But I do think that there is a problem with sort of a systematic, a systemic um, you know, remedies I think it's more sort of, oh, that looks really cool. Oh, you know, and, and that I think is the biggest problem. And that's why I feel that we haven't gotten the traction yet. And we're still talking about the same things that we were 10, 20 years ago. Really. Kevin, we just talked about community advocacy and the important role there. What I'm wondering is, and especially like I see so many park advocates in this room, are you seeing the tension on some of these new spaces between all the things that the park has to address, are you seeing programmatic tension in some of these communities where you're building new parks? Absolutely. That, that hap I think that's happened probably since the common was built, <laughs> if I have my history straight. And so that's human nature. Um, I, that's why I think it's important to understand w what elements of livability in whatever city you're working in, whether it's Boston or Cleveland or Miami, um, which of those things are below where they need to be, below benchmarks or something? And I believe in Boston, it, as I mentioned before, inequalities are, are a big concern. Um, the fact that we're catching up on infrastructure maintenance after the recession is huge. Um, and then frankly, climate, climate justice, a just transition into a different climate is critical in this city. Um, and I think you can address those things. Say climate, for example, you can have a climate smart park that for, for the neighborhood's perspective is a public outdoor performing space. And that's what they want. And, and you can provide that for them in a way that still cools the neighborhood, that still captures storm water from int int more intense r uh, runoff events, or, or helps people get around through walking and biking. I think you can do a little bit of both. Right. Ted, you showed in your, your pictures just how we can democratize the space and that people of all backgrounds can come and gather in parks, and in fact, they're compelled to do so. What I wonder, though, is a lot of the friction that we see in the city is we do need to partner more uh, with private institutions and come up with public-private partnerships on this public space. How do we also ensure that these parks are still open and inclusive to all and really welcoming. I was wondering if you would give any thought to that. Yeah, it's a big challenge, uh, particularly in a city that is so driven by entrepreneurship and uh, a gig economy where uh, we no longer have the kind of um, corporations uh, which existed in the city and felt vested in the city. Uh, as a place uh, where they would uh, likely be in 20 years and therefore uh, were willing to make more of a long-term investment. Uh, we have conversations about this within uh, the BPDA, that is to say, to what extent can the um, will and the availability of capital uh, to be invested uh, in the city be leveraged um, in a way that contributes to the public trust. Um, certainly we've been able to and make some small progress in that area uh, around uh, issues of affordable housing and the like. But part of the problem we have is that um, parks are considered uh, to be a free 
asset, uh, unlike housing or uh, the use of the MBTA or a range of other services uh, that are available in the city, uh, people use the parks freely and don't pay for that. Um, and uh, very often what that does is to dampen the sense of advocacy that ought to exist um, because people take it for granted that a park is always just going to be there. Um, and, and I think that part of the challenge we have is to um, link uh, parks with resiliency, which people are willing to invest in, um, in a way where uh, it becomes more clear that uh, the parks are an essential part um, of how we make the city more resilient and sustainable. Um, and that is something that corporations have shown some will to invest in. Kevin, it seems like the Trust for plan, uh, Public Land has put a stake in the ground that there's a fundamental right to just have access to a park. And then we start to think about what that park is afterwards. It's a quality park, but there's what are those actual physical barriers that Trust for Public Land is encountering that keep people from, from accessing the park? The boring answer is walls. Yeah. Fences. Right. Um, you know, we're working with uh, DCR right now and uh, the, the, Ma the Madpan neighborhood uh, along the deposit to deal with this his unfortunately historic That's right. WPA era wall that has literally kept the neighborhood from experiencing what is otherwise a very precious little nat natural mm -hmm. area along the deposit river. Um, and that also unfortunately disguises um, sort of derelict uses and dumping and things like that. So you know, tackle, literally removing physical barriers or adding entrance points to parks can have a very, it's a very simple initiative that can have a very profound impact on a neighborhood. It's a great, great return on investment. So, so just so folks in the audience know that this is a real thing, using the Trust for Public Land tool, we actually created a new interest for one of our parks in High Park, and we were able to serve something like a thousand more people just because we added another entrance. It didn't cost us any additional money for the capital planning, and it's not something we would have done if we had just renovated the entrance in the exact place. Uh, doctor, we heard a, a, a good idea that we should use the hook of resilience in order to get some of our parks funded. Are there any concerns about that or are there any opportunities that we could jump on by getting you know, the excitement around the fact that January and March storms got everyone's attention, right? And so is there a moment that we should now capitalize on? You know, um, <laughs> it's an interesting question in the sense that obviously we all know that you know, having parks and green spaces is going to mitigate climate change. But I don't know if that's the hook to really get people interested in parks, that we're going to take care of the storms and the water management and so on. I really think that, that you know, it goes to the heart of what we began with, the people. And I think if we are able to sort of create a community momentum and show what is possible, I think uh, we can sort of do the other pieces as well, but that doesn't seem to be the primary focus. But the primary focus is more you, you need it because you don't have it and you have access and here's a beautiful park where you can bring the community together. But I think that's the hook. I don't think <laughs> the storm water management would be the hook, really. I think you had a fascinating statistic that I'm going to absolutely butcher. Did you say that if we increase our open space by 10 percent, we green green space, green space. So, so this is a distinction I want to make. Sure. I, I think we are talking about parks in terms of just open space, be it paved, asphalted, permeable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is tree canopy, green space of a certain density. Yeah. yeah. Ted, uh, when you were talking about Carter uh, Playground and the renovation that Northeastern's almost completed with, it reminds me that it's right adjacent to the Southwest Corridor and that so many of these issues around what people can access in order to recreate themselves, to recreate, is about that connectivity. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, the South End and how some of that park development and how important that is to the community, because it is the recipient of extraordinary park and green spaces, but there could have been a highway running through there as well, right? 
Yeah, um, and, and there is uh, finally some very good writing that's going on on how uh, stopping a highway uh, not only uh, improved uh, public transit, uh, but created a park that runs uh, right through the city from uh, beyond Jamaica Plain into downtown, basically, um, and created open spaces that are very, very heavily used. Uh, and not only for uh, coming and going, but also for uh, kids and folks to hang out on weekends and what have you. Um, very often, we need to think about um, one aspect of problem solving, transportation, for example, um, as a way of leveraging the good that can be brought out to solve other kinds of issues. Um, and when the highway was stopped, um, I don't think anyone anticipated that uh, the park would become as vibrant as it has. Um, we talked a lot, for example, about burying the central artery, uh, but I don't think most folks really anticipated that you'd get the kind of uh, vibrant action um, uh, along the, uh, the park there that we have at this moment. The, the goal is to think in the long term of some of the secondary and tertiary benefits that could accrue from fixing one problem. And uh, I would submit that when um, the first really major storm hits Boston and has severe yeah. impacts, uh, everyone in the city is going to think differently about open space and about water management um, and about uh, the cost of uh, not integrating parks into a process that uh, really is essential for a coastal city. That's right. And Kevin, uh, one last question for you, which is uh, every city trust for public land works in, especially Boston, has the jurisdictional issues that Ted flagged in his slideshow. How do we navigate that? How do we propel a vision that is agnostic on jurisdiction? <laughs> Fans, great leaders uh, in City Hall. Um, but I, I, I'm joking, actually, I mean, it really does come from the top. Yeah. You, you do need a mayor yeah. who is willing to make some tough calls. Um, you know, I think the story about the closure of Times Square by Michael Bloomberg is instructive for all of us. Right. There, if you didn't know, it was, it was, I believe, the most dangerous intersection in America. It had some terrible distinction, and they had all sorts of traffic studies, and everybody knew it had to be done. Um, to cut down on pedestrian accidents there, and yet everyone was paralyzed. And essentially, Michael Bloomberg instructed his uh, chief of streets to, in the middle of the night, put some very large, temp but very movable, yet temporary planters out there, and it's the Times Square you see today. Um, it, so it takes that kind of leadership and vision, and that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the mayor showing us on Columbia Road. <laughs> Uh, with that, uh, are there questions from the audience? Yeah, so feel free to come right down here to the, the mic. Two quickies. Uh, Community Preservation Act was brought up. Yeah, I'm glad that Boston have voted and mm -hmm. adopted it. We, it has been in existence in Cambridge, and every, uh, people who are familiar with this CPA process will know that it's, you know, a minimum of 10% for historic preservation, 10% for uh, open space, 10% for housing. In Cambridge, it has never been anything other than 80% for housing because of the affordable housing crisis. I don't expect that that crisis is any different, maybe even more so in Boston. Yes. So it's, should it be, really, should we expect it to be any more than 10% for open space? If so, why? Um, of course, housing is also very important in terms of access. To, you know, that's, housing segregation is also a factor, but that would be my first question to speak to the CPA. The second one is, today was the last day of the DCR pool being open in North Cambridge. It used to be open through Labor Day weekend. What's the problem? Great. So the first one, um, I think, is, uh, is really at the crux of one of the projects that Kevin is working on. And, and Ted, if you want to chime in on the BPDA side, I'd be happy to. But what was interesting is the idea of CPA, which actually is going to be explored for your Grove Hall project.
project as well, is that here we are in the middle of a, a housing crisis in the city of Boston. You talk about the wealth inequity, and yet a neighborhood is still standing up saying they want to park in that place. Do you have any sense of what might be driving that? And you and your organization were a huge proponent of Community Preservation Act. Are there, is there a threshold goal that you're hoping for? for parks and open space? So uh, every city uses the Community Preservation Act in, in very wildly different ways. And Cambridge is, is a great example of one end of the spectrum. It's sort of like the example across the Commonwealth of where you're just all in on housing for 15, 20 years. Um, but I think I've looked more recently to how Somerville has been spending their CPA funds and it's been very balanced. And I have to credit Mayor Curtitone for being very clear about his intentions on having it be balanced and creating a community preservation commission that indeed has a, a wide representation of interests on it. And Mayor Walsh basically followed that template. So uh, they've had one round of funding. They called it a pilot round. Um, and it was quite equitably distributed, I felt. And so I thought that was a really good indication that I think this particular iteration of the Community Preservation Act in Massachusetts is going to be one that's, it will change over time. And that's the beauty of the Community Preservation Act. If a giant project comes along and you really need to go all in on it, you can. But then you can reset and go back to something else. Yeah. And I, I'll take a stab at the DCR pool question, even though I'm not in charge of the Department of Conservation and Recreation, is just, I just have the most profound respect for that department. I mean, just an extraordinary department who does amazing work. When you think about the size and scope of some of their properties and, and their mandate, I think it's one of those things that we have to speak about when Ted said parks are not free, and yet we treat them as free. Where the rubber hits the road on that is the programming of those parks. If they don't have staff, if they don't have lifeguards, if the funds aren't available, you know, that pool's not going to be open. So these parks aren't free. And I think so we as communities, we as citizens do have to recognize that and figure out a way to fund it. Um, I, I don't know who was first. I apologize. So, yeah. Um, good question. Do you guys believe economical barrier and segregation and gentrification has an impact in low functional parks in some neighborhoods like Maripan, Dorchester, and Waxbury? And what do the city plan to do about it? Right. So is there an equitable distri distribution in neighborhoods like? Yeah. I mean, some of the parks, you know, they have like low maintenance or yep. you know, low function <laughs> and That's right. old equipment. So what is the city plan to do about it? I mean, I, I see your slide about like the, in the low income neighborhood like Maripan, right. Dorchester, Waxbury, where, you know, so. Less green. Yes. yes. So what the city plan to do about it? and about to imagine 20, 30, 30 Awesome, and I'm gonna embarrass you. Is anyone enjoy the gorgeous flowers of the Boston Public Garden? Yeah, Josh is the person who plants them, and he's extraordinary. <laughs> he, uh, he designs them all, and so I think there's a couple of different things there. There's the inequity of maintenance in public spaces, and how does one address that? And Madhu, I don't know if you've seen this in cities. Is there is there a way to tackle this problem? Because this is the other wicked problem associated with the access. Yes, you can walk to a park within 10 minutes, but what if it's not being maintained in the same way? <laughs> I'm going to step back. Sure, please. And then step forward. You know, because I'm I'm still sort of um, bothered by by sort of some of the comments from the previous, and not so much about what you guys said. But, um, you know, we are always looking at sort of affordable housing, the need for affordable housing or housing and urbanization as sort of, and then the preservation and, and the creation of green spaces as being sort of at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. And we are always thinking about it as if it's like a zero sum game, you know? And I think this is where the problem with our mindset is. I think we really need to understand, I mean, you know, we have, we are one of the most innovative species in the world, really. So we need to understand how can we bring in all the benefits of green while still being able to, you know, create the densification we need. And, and you know, I just don't want to leave this without any answers, but 
there are many cities in the world, uh, I'm thinking about Copenhagen and Singapore, right. for example, where you know it's not about creation of green space, but really taking stock of what we have, yep. which includes the maintenance of what we have, the sidewalks, the parking spaces, which are unused. And if we can get that kind of inventory and data, we can actually start to understand how to zone those as green spaces while keeping with the densification. I think that's a great approach to you treat know. it as infrastructure that we have to take care of. One just note that I'll add to it in the city, the issue of equity around maintenance, uh, we have a park inspection program and until recently it was like hit or miss. You know, someone would go out, they'd look at a park and then it would create work orders of things that happen to do, whether it's a park bench broken or now. What happens now is that actually, that park inspection has a number associated with yes. it. That goes into an algorithm. And what we're able to do at the end of the year is we're able to look at the lower scores, and that's how we're choosing to develop our capital plan now, is the parks with the lower scores. So we're ensuring equity, not just through complaints, not just through city council or advocacy, but we're trying to actually score those parks on what they look like and what's broken. It's not perfect but it is a problem that we're trying to struggle to get Who's through. Who's doing the scoring, Chris? I'm sorry. The Parks Department, yeah. One, one person, his name's Scott, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Scott's busy. Um, one thing I'd like, I can't, I, one of the last statements made of talking about how everything has to be done at the top is something I'd like to strongly disagree with. I think that most of the connections between agencies that I've seen has come from the grassroots and not from the top. It really happens already now. I've been working on the Neponset Trail and the Neponset Greenway system for almost 30 years now. I'm the chair of the Greenway Council there. And we work with the state, we work with the city, we work with police, we work with everybody just to try to make things happen. We have four different neighborhoods involved and a bunch of sub-neighborhoods within them. And the, the people across it are what makes it work. We've outlasted four DCR planners. Well, we outlasted the MDC first. We outlasted four planners. We've outlasted two administrations of the city. We've outlasted the nonprofit that got us started. Um, TPL was involved at the very beginning too, and they've been involved a couple times since then. So I think what you really need is an active community involvement first. Mm -hmm. Ted, can you speak about the importance of grassroots more eloquently than that? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, but I, I, I will say it's, it's a, um, a, a two-way process. Yeah. Uh, grassroots organizations can do a lot of stuff on their own, um, but unless there is uh, the will and the allocation of resources, in support of those grassroots efforts, um, what uh, more often than not happens is that uh, you go through decades of churning uh, of uh, activity. And at some point, uh, uh, people who we hold accountable uh, to uh, deliver improved services um, have to actually say, we're going to spend the money um, or we're going to close the road um, or, um, as was the case when uh, uh, a, a previous administration was working on uh, reducing gang violence in the neighborhood and they asked people in the neighborhood, what is the metric that we should use uh, to determine whether you feel safer in your neighborhood? And all the neighbors said, if you get the needles out of the parks so that we can take our kids in and feel safe doing that. I mean, it took th the city then to say, okay, we'll remove the needles. Uh, so you, it's, it's a two-way street, really, um, that is highly dependent on community activism and engagement of new people as they come into the communities. Uh, and that's why I, I made the comment in my slide about um, expanding the, the, the nature of engagement. Um, in my experience, too often you get a group of park advocates or uh, safety advocates or whatever, um, and they carry the ball, and new people move into the community, and they don't always look the same as the people who've been carrying the ball, um, and there's not enough of an effort made to engage the new people in the community. And as Boston's demographics change, we have to uh, continue to find ways to be as inclusive as possible 
uh, lest that kind of energy uh, uh, starts to wither. Hi, my name's Kelly, um, and I'm an aspiring urban green space planner too. And just like you guys, I wanna make parks more equitable. One thing I've come across that I can't fully wrap my head around is green gentrification. What mm. can we do to stop that? Mm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we were so close. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a big one. Um, so again, it's the idea of green gentrification. I just want to make sure that I don't characterize your, your question in the wrong way, but it's this idea that really dynamic, bold, beautiful, renovated parks, especially new ones, can actually drive gentrification in neighborhoods. Yeah, and actually be a contributing factor. And I think this is something that is happening nationally. Uh, Maru, Kevin, I don't know if you have anything to, to, to talk to solve that problem, but. Well, there's, there's the idea of, we've talked about this a little bit before in other venues about the idea of just green enough which came out of the Bay Area. Um, you know, the sound of that alone doesn't make me a fan of the idea. Because um, I, again, I believe everyone should have every, you know, as green as you want in your neighborhood. Um, but I understand the concept behind it. That to design the investments in the parks to, to reflect the neighborhood, to match the neighborhood. Uh, to move it a step up. I think you just need to be sensitive about who is there, what changes are going on in the neighborhood, and, and, and keep your ears open. But it is, it, I won't, won't lie, it is a very tricky subject. It's, a tricky, it's maybe the trickiest subject in any community meeting that you might have. Um, and it's the trickiest thing to kind of do in practice, partly because there are so many other variables that drive just, uh, just displacement. You know, um, this is happening all over the world in all the major cities, you know, in Barcelona, London, other places. In fact, there's a friend and colleague of mine who's working on this very same thing in Europe, and they have a lot of funding to study just this. And uh, what they're finding is that, uh, that this gentrification, as you call it, has become so pronounced that, uh, you know, people are actually afraid to develop pocket parks and things like that, particularly in the UK in some cases. So, you know, now that we are aware that this is a problem, I think, again, uh, really, I, I believe in policy. I believe in champions in the system. I mean, so really, there's no silver bullet, you know, like everything, there's no silver bullet. But certainly, the awareness should make us also, just like how we have so much sort of market rate housing and so much affordable, maybe the funds for you know, what's spread out goes to the more needy and that is sort of uh, protected through different policy mechanisms. And I think that's a great point. You have to be very intentional about the programming. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know who's, yeah, Ted. And I, I think both the design and programming of spaces have to be um, uh, instituted in a way uh, that, um, encourages existing residents or new residents of limited means to continue to use those places. Uh, the, the parks, as, as I've said, are one of the few places where people can come together. Not everyone has a family where their kids are gonna come together in schools. And our workplaces are highly segregated. So the question is, uh, how does one create a space uh, where the programming uh, brings different kinds of people together on a regular basis. And that's what happens in parks. Um, I have yet to find any place that has been able to stop gentrification in any of a range of realms, yes. whether it's housing or transportation or parks use or, or schools or what have you. Um, gentrification will probably continue to happen as long as uh, we have a limited supply of certain assets, like housing, um, and an uh, and almost unlimited supply of, of capital uh, that moves um, uh, the economics of a neighborhood upward. But the question is, while a neighborhood is improving, uh, do you drive out the people who've been there? And programming can help to uh, mitigate that. I, don't, I apologize, I wasn't paying attention to who's next, so please. Hi, um, I've been doing a little history reading, and I was wondering um, about the parkways. 
Uh, most of our inequities in the region, in the metropolitan area, are, you could say, are tied to the different municipalities and how they protect their school systems and they don't provide affordable housing in the communities. And I'm wondering, you know, kind of like is the public um, story down in New York and New Jersey where they believe the parkways were restricted to transit because of racist ideas of keeping people out of the suburbs. Um, we also have the same restriction on our DCR parkways. And I'm wondering, you know, if people are thinking about that. And, and uh, you know, some of them, i uh, use the example of uh, Fresh Palm Parkway and Route 2 out to Arlington and Concord, which mm -hmm. are towns that don't have enough affordable housing, um, would be, you know, one of the faster routes to get a transit out there. Um, and same, say, for uh, uh, the J-Way. Um, so, and, and out to West Roxbury on Center Street. So, um, yeah, I just kind of want to hear what people think about that. And also, historically, yeah. you said you were reading a lot of Olmstead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did he ever say anything really bad? Yeah, sure. <laughs> about that? Or, uh, I'm sure. That? I'm sure he did. I concentrate on the good stuff, though. But the I would I would say the Parkways have a very complicated legacy, and anyone feel free to jump in. I think it's an excellent point. One thing, just to leave you with like a, a really scary thought to to sort of emphasize your point. Robert Moses and his expansion into Long Island and what he did to neighborhoods and to communities was inspired by the emerald necklace and the roadways that were there. Now he took it to a different level, obviously. Um, but where you have a foundation in someone like Olmsted who believed in the democracy of space and he actually believed it was a place that people of all social strata would be able to interact and I think that's evident in some of his designs, it can show you that, you know, well-intentioned ideas can go sideways. I don't know if other people have ideas about roads and what they can do to communities. A lot. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the DCR question is, is, I'm not an expert in it, but the one thing I would say is that I do think it's time uh, for us to push the envelope on our streets as public spaces. It's the largest public land the city of Boston owns are its streets. And you know, DCR is kind of a separate beast, and I don't know the history of it to answer your question, but uh, thinking about the Fairmount Corridor, which is really just the streetscape around the rejuvenated Fairmount line um, is a fantastic idea. And it's something that can incorporate affordable housing and green spaces and transportation all together. It just takes that leadership because you need so many different agencies to, to do what the community wants to do. Yeah, and we have to think forward. Um, over the last five years, Uber and Lyft have fundamentally changed uh, transportation patterns in Boston in a way that was not clearly anticipated a decade ago. And the advent of autonomous vehicles uh, is now being seen by a number of people uh, as a way of, of uh, regaining a certain kind of control over the streetscape in a way that may reduce the number of vehicles on the roads and lead to wider sidewalks and more handicapped accessibility and all of that. So we have to uh, not only think about uh, addressing the transportation problem, but think about how addressing that, and the parkways are a perfect example, how addressing the, the, the congestion and the transportation problem can in fact create more open space that uh, then becomes uh, usable by a wider range of people. If it makes you feel better, Leo Roy, the commissioner, he's got a big sign in his wall that says, a parkway is a park with a road in it, not the other way around. So. Hi, I'm a recent graduate from the Rhode Island School of Design, and I actually just finished a thesis on the impetus of Olmstead's legacy in Boston and the topic of green gentrification. And my focus is mostly on community land trust, but I actually want to ask you about um, privately owned public space, since that was something that came up a lot tonight. So I came across a website um, in, that New York City has, and it um, I think it's just one guy that kind of did this, and he... What's up? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so he created a website and- Is Gerald Caden the Graduate School of Design? Yep. Okay, so he uploaded plans of all the privately owned public space in New York City and there's a 
um, a link where you can upload your own redesigns of these plans to kind of put pressure on these private owners to make them more accessible. So we talked about accessibility <laughs> in terms of taking down fences, in terms of um, grading for wheelchairs and all of that. But what about accessibility in terms of simply finding the spaces we already have in the city that are not necessarily readily found? It's a great question. I'll open up to the entire panel is how do we access some of these private held open spaces and make sure that people actually know about them so that they can use them? And then how do I would add, how do you maybe how do you expand those models as well? Well, I would just say that uh, a start um, is to use these new, uh, this is still fairly new BPDA three dimensional maps uh, to explore neighborhoods and to look at those spaces that um, uh, it's not always easy to tell immediately, uh, may be available for public uses. My understanding is that uh, the, one of the algorithms they're looking at at this moment would overlay uh, whether the spaces are privately or publicly owned. I would start with that as a way of identifying things. I mean, as recently as five years ago, almost no one had any clear idea right. of uh, who owned what and what spaces were uh, under whose jurisdiction, and, and that is changing. Um, and I would say, particularly for the folks who are here, um, if you don't see that within a year or so, then you really need to uh, raise the level yeah. with the urban mechanics and, and other folks in, in city government about uh, making that kind of data available. Uh, we all want to be more transparent, making it happen, takes a little bit of time, but that's that's where I would start. And I don't know if anyone's seen like the Boston Harbor Now website that just shows you where the bathrooms are, and the city of Boston's that shows you where the bathrooms are, but the Boston Harbor Now website, you know, takes it one step further and shows all the chapter 91 protected open spaces in the city. It's an extraordinary tool, and you know, if it wasn't for nonprofit leadership like that, we'd really be lost in the city. With last two, thank you very much. I don't know what the order is. still new to Boston, forgive me. Uh, I moved here from New York City where I previously worked with the New York City Park System. And we had a program um, called the City Parks Initiative where we mapped out the worst parks and the worst neighborhoods and basically the most underserved neighborhoods and we just put tons of programming in them. My first job was to drive a van into the Bronx and like play basketball with kids, which was a terrible idea, as you can see. But we had a lot of success with just putting programming into these parks and making them more accessible. So I don't know what the programming structure looks like in Boston, but I was wondering what, what kinds of programs are in the parks, and is there a focus on just putting programs into the parks to maybe you know, make them safer? Is it okay for me to take it? It's just, all right. So uh, the Boston Parks Department, we produce roughly 800 to 1,200 free events. And then we call them events because they're all different. You know, one might be a major concert with 1,500 people. One might be a watercolor workshop with just five or six kids. But we do look at it geographically. So at the beginning of the season, we just try to provide an equity of distribution of all of our programming. That's a lot of events, and we actually have to privately fundraise for it. We have a nonprofit associated with our office that can Conveniently, I'm the president of the Fund for Boston Parks and Recreation, and so we go out and we try to raise the funds so that we can actually have that activity. I think DCR does the same thing. DCR tries to program their spaces as much as possible. It's really important to pay attention to the equity lens, though, because it is really easy, because an event is successful in a park, and because you get a good crowd, it is really easy. It's, there's an instinct as a programmer to just Absolutely. keep going back to that well. And so I think it's really providing that diversification of what you're offering and making sure that it's culturally resonant with the, com the community that you're in is very important. Um, the only thing I would add to that though is that is dwarfed by what the people of Boston do themselves, right? So the people of Boston activate their parks and they do it in a big way. Franklin Park is one of the busiest places you've ever seen every single, every Saturday, every Sunday. It is completely banged out and it's just activated by the people who live around the park. Um, so making sure that there's space for that, making sure there's space for people to actually program the park, I think that's one of the tools we have against gentrification as well, is making sure that it's a space that people can program themselves. But we're very active on it, but we could always do more. I apologize. Yeah, I was ranting. Go ahead right there, yeah. I think some of the barriers is the um when politicians uh, invite investors into the city and we give them incentives 
And knowing what they have in their portfolio, um, I think we need to look deeper into their, the investors' portfolios. Um, I think that's the part there. And we know this over and over again, like Professor um, Dukta said, Kaler said. Um, this is something that's been going on for years and years and years, and we could invest more, but we need to look at the investors' portfolio. That is the bottom line. We need to find, find where that money is, and we need to know where the money is. And that's, that's the bottom line. That's all I wanted to say. So there's a, it's very difficult to find a comparable period of development in the city of Boston with what we're experiencing right now. And so I would open it up to the whole panel. Are we taking advantage enough of this? Are we, are we asking enough of these folks who are investing in our city? Well, I, I would just say, um, since I do feel a little responsible for um, both some of the bad things that have happened and, and some of the good things that are happening. Um, uh, 25 or 30 years ago, the city looked at its financial base, and the big issue was that, uh, unlike many other uh, cities, we have a disproportionate number of properties that are held by nonprofit entities universities, hospitals, uh, state agencies, government agencies, churches, what have you. And as a result of that, we had it at that time one of the smallest uh, capital bases uh, of, of revenue generating real estate of any major city in the country. And as a result, there wasn't money for schools, there wasn't money for park maintenance, there wasn't money for uh, improving police and, and fire services. Uh, we just didn't have it. And uh, a bunch of things were maintained, but uh, a bunch of things also deteriorated. So I'm now on the BPDA board, and uh, certainly not because of anything I've done, but the city has, uh, I think, the uh, highest bond rating in its history, um, the most balanced budget that it's ever had, and it's investing in things like after-school programs, and youth programming of a type that we wanted to do years ago but didn't have the money for, and parks programs, and road improvements, and a range of other services that we can now take for granted because we have the money to do it. And that's only because a bunch of private developers, whether they're coming from oligarchs, or people laundering money, or experienced investors who are uh, building wonderful um, housing developments. Um, Boston is an attractive city because we have a huge demand uh, for uh, the housing that they can develop. Um, and what that huge demand is generating revenue to enable us to purchase services for residents of the city that we couldn't purchase 25 years ago. So it's fine to say that we should be vetting developers to only get the good guys. And in fact, we have a bunch of good guys. Uh, we have folks, for, for example, who are now developing workforce housing, yeah. and we didn't see very much of that. And we have people who are coming in and they're doing sustainable projects. And we have people who are showing more sensitivity. But the question is, how do you say no to the bad developer based upon what you see in their portfolio that they've developed in another city. And there may be cities that are in a position to do that. There may be algorithms and metrics that you apply uh, to a developer who says, I want to come in and I want to build uh, a tower full of uh, $2 million condos that are going to throw off uh, several million dollars a year of, of capital for public services. But I don't know of any city that's been able to do that. And by the time, in my view, we figure that out, this current boom will likely have diminished. And we may or may not still have the resources we need to provide the services that we want to provide across the city. And so there's a tough balancing act when you're dealing with private developers and their money, and you are seeking to extract from them uh, commitments and funds that make other good things possible in the city. Professor Kevin? Yeah. 
No, I completely agree. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for our panel. Thanks so much for joining us. Come join us at the exhibit. Thank you so much. <laughs>